What should the government do to protect our personal data? Operators of personal data such as e-commerce, mobile operators or even most government agencies have to abandon the practice of storing personal data. There has to be a regulation that mandates it. This is not a joke. In fact, this is the only possible way to ensure privacy. Centralization and concentration of personal data is the reason data compromise becomes possible. No matter how many shields of protections operators apply, only the change of this flawed paradigm can change the situation. In this series of videos, I would like to discuss what can become an alternative. Hi, my name is Dr. Alexey Konosheic. You are on Blockchain State. Panic doctors' customers are rushing to change their passports and licenses after their personal details are exposed in that massive cyber attack. Recently, we could observe outrageous data breaches in Australia. Firstly, the mobile operator Optus got a leakage of customers' driver licenses. Why would the mobile operator store the driver licenses of its customers? And then the breach of Medibank, one of the largest Australian private health insurance providers which exposed the health data of millions of Australians. Have you ever asked why, for example, the almighty big tech cannot protect their services? During the last several years, we can refer to plenty of breaches that hurt the reputation of Google, Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, Microsoft, Visa, MasterCard, you name it. Why wouldn't they protect their systems? Are their software engineers incompetent? There is no simple answer to this because each data breach is unique, but all such cases have one feature in common. It became possible because data operators store personal data. And in many cases, it appears they store more than they need and much longer than they need. And if your first thought was that to stop storing personal data is too radical and impossible, I will try to persuade you otherwise. It requires a shift in how the data is organized and circulated. The problem can be addressed at its root. If the operator doesn't keep personal data, there will be nothing to steal. What is easier to target? One server that stores the data of millions of users or millions of standalone user devices? The user must get full control over their personal data by storing it on their own devices and sharing it only temporarily and in the amount that is necessary for a particular transaction. This is called self-sovereign identity. But in most cases, as you will see, there will be no need to share the data. Generally, this class of protocol is called zero-knowledge proofs, but we'll get to it. How to prevent data breaches? At the moment, you can observe a few major discussions on how to address these problems. The first is to increase the security level in the conventional centralized IT infrastructure. It never gives 100 protection. I know, I know, there is no such a thing as 100 protection. My point here is that this is always lower than we would normally expect, saying using offline services, surely. Those who are completely reckless can address some obvious security issues using conventional protection methods. But like I said, the fact that it is concentrated somewhere becomes the reason why anyone would penetrate the system. Sooner or later, the one who chases it gets it. Optus Bridge, Medibank Bridge, they want it, they got it. How much proof do you need that conventional cybersecurity doesn't work. The second idea which I recently heard is to follow the course of the European Union and adopt GDPR. Third, delegating data storage to some government bodies is a bit more exotic. Let's take a look at both ideas. The European General Data Protection Regulation didn't solve the problem. Yes, it was an ambitious plan, but let's look at it from a higher perspective. They created regulatory pressure on data operators by imposing draconian fines for data breaches, for not informing about breaches, for unauthorized use of personal data and other violations. Living two years in Europe, 
The only change I notice is that data operators ask me at every corner for my consent to process personal data, but I didn't notice any reduction of data they take. They still collect so much data about their customers. So if plan was to disincentivize operators to process and store too much personal data, it didn't work. The only result they've got is that the data operators take these consents and do with data whatever they want. Because when you read such consent, you will be surprised how much you voluntarily grant them. Nevertheless, there must be high fines for bitches and other violations, as disturbingly many operators are reckless with personal data and not transparent regarding what they do with it. Besides, I admit the right to be forgotten is a fundamental right and a big achievement of this regulation. The right to be forgotten means that no matter where and how anyone stores and uses information about me, I have the right to mandate its full erasure. Cool, isn't it? Only in some cases, as per the law, this right is limited. For example, criminal records when you can't demand its erasure. By the way, it's a very interesting topic from the perspective of blockchain technology because the data in the ledger, in the cryptographic ledger, gets irrevocable. I will devote another video to this topic. Please make sure that you are subscribed, make sure you click that bell icon and uh, one more thing. As I'm not advertising anything in this video, my reward is your reaction. So please hit that like button and write a comment below. As it indicates to YouTube algorithms that the video is worth showing to other viewers. Thank you. Recently, I came across two initiatives of the Australian Minister for Digital in the state of New South Wales, Victor Dominello. Ironically, the first case is that the government shouldn't do, and the second initiative might become breakthrough in privacy protection. Rental data. In response to the oversharing of personal information regarding rental applications, New South Wales Minister for Digital Victor Dominella proposed that the data be shared only once to one government agency, the Rental Bond Board. Even though I highly respect the minister, many things he does are incredible. This is a questionable solution. In this situation where real estate agencies do not really care about the privacy of their clients, one of the solutions is to make them stop collecting and storing the data, but concentrating all the data in one hand of a government agency could be a fatal mistake. Even now, it's not that bad as the data is dispersed among multiple operators and one breach will expose the whole industry. No matter how disciplined the clerks of that agency will be, no matter how much they try to protect it, there's still a chance it will leak someday. It's a, such a tidbit. Nevertheless, in the next videos, when I will be elaborating on technical solutions, I will get back to this case and will show that such a government agency can become an intermediary that stores data, but encrypted, having no sole access to it. We're all well aware of the risks in handing out data to companies like Optus and Medibank, but what if you never had to reveal your address ever again? New South Wales is leading the way with a one-stop shop, allowing us to prove and protect our identity once and for all. The second project that has all chances to become one of the first in the world to embody the concept of self-sovereign identity at the state level. We have yet to learn much about it, as it's only recently introduced in the department's press release and TV news. What I concluded is that the government is going to introduce a mobile application that will store personal data verified across government databases. The user will be able to share it when it's needed, but the data will not be transferred uh, to data operators. They will be able to learn only that the requested information is confirmed. Say, if someone inquires about my driver license, they will learn that I've got one. 
If someone asks if I'm above a certain age, for example, uh, whether I'm allowed to buy alcohol, they will learn that I have reached that age. This is exactly what SSI, self serving identity, is about, as well as zero knowledge proof protocol and selective disclosure protocol. If someone asks if you are above 18, you don't need to tell them your date of birth. They don't need to know your name. They just need to make sure you're above 18. It's yes or no answer. With these technologies, this all becomes possible. I will keep collecting information about this project and will try to review it as soon as I get more information. Also, in the next video, I will discuss how exactly companies can deal with personal data when they need to do business, for example, to make a delivery to your door or when they must monitor financial transactions and KYC and how technologies can make it possible not to store the personal data but to store only evidence that you did KYC right. Meanwhile, you're welcome to watch my video about self-sovereign identity and selective disclosure protocol on the example of the European Digital Identity Regulation. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.